actually have quite weak magnetic fields, um, but over the size that they cover, um, we, can, uh, we can measure them. Uh, in astrophysics, we also have some uh, real extremes in magnetism. Um, if you go to, say, the strength um, of uh, the solar magnetic field, that's even stronger than a fridge magnet. Um, and then way up there on the top right, we have things like pulsars and magnetars, um, which are some of the strongest magnets that we know of. Uh, I'll, I might touch briefly on them in a little bit. Um, but those are some of the most extreme magnetic environments that we know of. Um, and there's still a lot to answer in uh, the study of astrophysical magnetic fields. Um, some really fundamental questions, actually, including um, are magnetic fields something that were intrinsic to the universe? So do they have a cosmological origin um, and have then been, um, become part of the, the astrophysics that we observe? Um, or are magnetic fields something that have been produced by astrophysical objects, so proto-galaxies, and then we see them kind of permeate through the universe? Um, that's one of the big questions in, in astrophysics. Um, and just generally even finding out more about the magnetic field of our own Milky Way galaxy. Um, very local to us, uh, relatively. Um, but still, there's a lot of questions about how the magnetic fields work in our own Milky Way galaxy and galaxies like it. Um, and just questions like, is the universe itself magnetic? Um, some of these are big research questions that get answered, that get asked. Um, but I want to address the slightly clickbaity um, subtitle to my talk, which was uh, observing the invisible or seeing the invisible. Um, because I just want to talk about two ways in which, well, two things that you could consider invisibility to be. Um, so first of all, you can consider invisible to be no optical light. So something that we wouldn't be able to see with our own eyes. But something that you could say pick up um, with um, a thermal infrared camera, or so night vision goggles essentially is how they work, um, or do tricks like uh, using ultraviolet light. See, even though we can't see them, there is still light there. It's just not in the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. On the right here, I've got an example of something that is completely invisible. There is no electromagnetic um, energy that we get from that whatsoever. Uh, I don't suppose anyone recognises what that little gif on the right is of. Exactly, yeah. It's the black hole at the centre of our galaxy, and we can't see it. Well. Um, it's very, very difficult to see. I'm not going to say it's uh, impossible to detect um, electromagnetic radiation from its vicinity. Um, but really the easiest way to know that the black hole is there is by observing its effect on other things. So in this case, this is the, um, uh, the path of stars that are very, very close to our galactic centre. And so I'm using this to um, illustrate the concept of how something can have an effect on other things, and so we can infer its existence that way. Um, which is what we have to do a lot of the time in understanding magnetic fields. Um, so just a brief refresher on the electromagnetic spectrum um, using this diagram here. So we've got optical in the middle, um, and what we're going to be interested in today primarily is the radio part of the spectrum. So that's the, the longest wavelengths. Now, I want you to put this diagram up especially because it highlights one of the good, well, the thing, the thing that is really useful about radio astronomy, and that is it can be done from the ground. Um, space telescopes are wonderful, and they give us some amazing images of the universe, but they're also really hard to get up into space and maintain and expensive. It's much easier if you can have a ground-based telescope. So that's what we have with a lot of optical observatories. Obviously, you can um, get rid of some of the problems with being under the atmosphere if you go up into space, but it's not impossible to observe from the ground. Um, and the same is, is true for radio waves. Um, so radio astronomy, optical astronomy, the two ones that you can do from the ground, and you don't have to send something up above the atmosphere to observe. So that's what I do. I'm a radio astronomer. Um, and how many of you have, have been to see uh, the Lovell Telescope in person? I think, has there been a trip yet? Someone has a trip? Yeah, I think a few of you have. If you get the opportunity to go, I'd really recommend it. Um, just how the road goes. Um, so that is possibly.
possibly one of the radio telescopes that you're most familiar with, uh, the lovely Lowell Telescope down at Hufflepuff Observatory. Um, and this telescope here, I guess, is fairly similar. It's meant for dishes. This is the ASCAP radio telescope in Western Australia. And that's the telescope that I use for my, my research. So I don't use the radio telescope that's just down the road from us. I use the one that's on the opposite side of the world. But um, they each do unique, uh, different things. Um, you'll notice that ASCAP is made up of multiple dishes that are much smaller than the level, but together they make up an instrument that is arguably more powerful. You can get radio telescopes that look like that, just a pole in a field. Um, that is one of the dipole antennas from the LOFAR telescope. Um, and this is the picture I took at the uh, core, which is in the Netherlands. Um, but you can make a radio telescope just from poles and wires. A little bit more complicated than that, but the basics are there. So radio telescopes come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, again, so uh, for those of you who do physics, which is, I'm assuming, most of you, if not all of you, um, you might be familiar with this um, concept here, um, where the resolution of any telescope is proportional to the wavelength it is observing at. Um, and it's also inversely proportional to uh, the, the size of the telescope. So bigger telescope, better resolution, but also longer wavelength, poorer resolution. So as we're going into the radio radio in the electromagnetic spectrum, you might expect, well, for a similar size telescope, we're going to get much poorer resolution. So we're not going to be able to uh, observe astronomical sources in the same level of detail. Um, and you can build radio telescopes a bit bigger. We saw the level just there. It's 76 meters in diameter. Uh, we have fully steerable radio telescopes, um, Ethelsberg and Greenback telescope, that are about 100 meters across. That's about the limit for something that you can steer and direct. Um, you ha we have Arecibo, rest in peace. Uh, that was about just over 300 meters. Um, but that has been superseded by the FAST uh, telescope in China, which is 500 meters across. So you can push it to be a large diameter, and it still doesn't quite compensate for the fact that these radio wavelengths um, just mean that by that very basic law of physics, you cannot observe in any greater detail. So what can you do about that? You, as with anything, there is an XKCD for that. Um, in this little comic, uh, you've got two, two little dogs, no way that you could uh, glide off into the sunset of them, but if you put them together, you make a large dog. Now, obviously that doesn't work in this specific scenario, but it is a technique that we can use in radio astronomy. Um, and uh, this is interferometry, which you may or may not have come across before. Um, but in essence, interferometry involves the combination of signals from two or more radio telescopes. And it uses the fact that a physical separation results in a timing offset uh, because light takes a little bit longer to travel to that telescope on the right, assuming they're looking in that direction there. Uh, and this does involve a lot of signal processing, so if you've done um, if any of the astrophysics lab experiments, then you might have had a little bit of an insight into that. Um, but effectively, this results in a combined telescope with the effective resolution of a telescope with a diameter equal to the longest baseline between the dishes. So if you have dishes spread out over a particular area, the effect is if you have got a telescope that's as big as the area that they cover. Note this is only for resolution. If you're thinking about the sensitivity of the telescope, so how much light it's able to connect, um, it's still just related to the total collecting area. So you won't be as sensitive as if you had a big dish um, on its own. Now, this has been really pushed to the limit um, recently. I'm sure you'll all be familiar with uh, that image on the top there. Um, from the Event Horizon Telescope. Um, and this really is pushing interferometry to its limits, limits to get the very best resolution that we can get. Um, you're using the largest possible baseline, basically the entire Earth. Um, there have been some radio telescopes sent into space. There was at one point a dish that was used in uh, an interferometry baseline between it and the Earth, but I'm not sure how successful that was. Anyway. 
the Earth is the entire baseline. And they went to the smallest possible wavelength at which it's easy to combine the signals in a kind of standard radio astronomy processing technique. So this was into the infrared. Um, you can do interferometry at optical wavelengths, say that's uh, the VLT does that, um, but it's very tricky and needs different methods to, to do that. Uh, but the result's best possible resolution, um, and that's how um, they managed to create images um, of the area around the black hole uh, in their 87. Um, so that's how you push the resolution. In terms of what you see in the radio sky, it's not dissimilar to what you would see in the optical sky. You, know, you look up, you see dots of light, um, except all the dots of light you see in that image there are galaxies, not stars. Um, if, you were, if you were able to look up into the night sky, and, and, or the daytime sky even, because it doesn't matter when it's radio, um, you would see something a little bit like that, um, where each of those dots are, are galaxies. And uh, over on the right, there's a composite image here, uh, which is of the Australia Telescope Compact Array. Um, and there's the moon in that image as well. But then overlaid onto that image, we have a radio image um, of a radio galaxy. And it would be that large uh, if you were able to see it in the sky. Um, and so yeah, the radio sky looks completely different. Um, I mentioned radio galaxies. Um, here's just a very quick introduction into them. Uh, these are my one of my favourite types of astronomical objects uh, because it's what I study. Um, but if you take a typical view of a galaxy, so here um, we've got Hercules A, um, and in the optical you can see it's a fuzzy blob about that big. But when you look in the radio, um, you can see these jets extending from either side of the galaxy um, that create glowing radio lobes. Um, and this is a result of the black hole um, at the centre of the galaxy. Uh, the accretion process uh, releases a lot of energy, and that energy is um, put into jets that come out from the black hole, uh, and then we see them ultimately stretch into the many, many times the size of the galaxy itself. And the reason we can see them so well in the radio is because they are synchrotron radiation. Um, synchrotron radiation um, is just emission resulting from um, a high energy particle, so for example a relativistic electron, um, and if it is accelerating, um, or so if it's, say, moving in a circle, um, then that will result in the emission of synchrotron radiation. Um, it's also detected from particle accelerators, so your synchrotron particle accelerator was where this kind of emission was first observed, and then it was connected to um, the astrophysical um, emission that we see. And it's one of the key mechanisms for astrophysical radio emission. So if we're seeing something on the radio, chances are um, the origin of it is relativistic electrons, and magnetic fields. Um, we can spot it quite easily in radio observations um, because it has a very characteristic power law spectrum. So each of these curves here is what you would see from an individual electron. Um, but when you combine them all together, um, you get a power law. Um, and the exponent of that power law is called the spectral index. So that's one of the key measurements that we make in radio astronomy. Uh, because that can tell us, is this synchrotron radiation we're looking at, does it have a spectral index of, it's about minus 0.7 um, for synchrotron radiation. Uh, if we see that, we think, ah, oh, great, that's synchrotron radiation. Um, if it's a bit steeper, then that indicates, oh, this is still synchrotron radiation, but it might be that this is um, from much older electrons, so electrons that have started to lose their energy. Um, if it's flatter, then it could be that it's not a relativistic uh, emission at all, synchrotron emission, it could be um, thermal from Stralin emission, for instance. So this is a really important tool we use in radio astronomy. Um, and we see a lot of it in the radio part of the spectrum um, because um, there is naturally a lot of emission um, in that area. So another view of um, our galaxy in 
the radio. So this is a look at the synchrotron emission from our galaxy. So we've got the galactic plane going on centre there. Uh, this is a bit uh, blown out, but you can see from the bulk of the synchrotron emission that we see is from, um, from our own galaxy. And we can see some of the features of the galaxy, like loops uh, coming off the plane. Um, and one of the links that we have to magnetic fields is that the intensity of synchrotron emission is proportional to uh, the magnetic field strength. So um, if you have a stronger magnetic field, your uh, relativistic electrons that are spiraling around, spiraling around are going to be accelerated more by a stronger magnetic field. Um, and so therefore, it's a, a tracer of the magnetic fields. Take off. <laughs> um, okay, so um, one really useful thing about synchrotron radiation as well is it can be polarized. So uh, we have um, polarization here. What it means is that the electromagnetic radiation is just oscillating in, in one particular plane and it's used in everyday life in things like cinema glasses, uh, different eyes will let in different polarizations. Um, and sunglasses, so reflections can often be polarised, so uh, it's useful to cut out glare. Um, here are some more, here's a more technical definition of polarisation, and one that we use in radio astronomy, um, is that we use the Stokes parameters, which you may or may not have come across before. Um, but what radio telescopes can do is they can measure the polarisation of radio waves by combining signals from two orthogonal feeds. Um, so you have feeds uh, yeah, that are orthogonal to each other, and then the signals that they measure can be used to measure the polarization of the incoming radio wave. So we quantify this using the Stokes parameters. We have the total intensity that we see, um, which is what is most used in radio astronomy. Um, but we can also look at the Q and U Stokes parameters um, and that gives us linear polarisation measurements. Um, and there's also V, which is circular polarisation. But it's not very common astrophysically. Um, so most people just completely ignore it. Some people are really interested in it. So you can get circular polarisation from uh, certain types of really interesting stars. So some people are only bothered about Stokes V. Uh, most people kind of just throw it away, it's not worth measuring. Uh, we stick to Q and E for linear polarisation. Uh, so you can get a polarised intensity, so how much of the radio emission we're receiving is polarised um, by just adding Q and E in quadrature. Um, and so that tells us um, a lot about the astrophysical conditions that are uh, emitting that polarised light. Um, and we also get a polarisation angle as well. Um, so the angle at which the electromagnetic wave uh, the, the, the plane is at. Now, these things are really important for the mechanism which is what I study. And this is a really crucial mechanism in the study of astrophysical magnetism with radio astronomy. Uh, and it's the Faraday effect. Um, and it's not unlike other um, uh, Faraday effects that you might see experimentally. Um, so you can do experiment like sugar solution and you can uh, change the polarization um, in that way. It's related to the uh, difference in uh, refractive index between black and white and the circular polarization. Anyway, what ultimately this results in for astrophysics um, is that if you get a polarized electromagnetic wave, so we have our radio wave here, if it travels through an area with magnetic fields and also electrons, they're also important, then it rotates the plane of polarization. So we get this twisted effect. Um, it happens in one direction if the magnetic fields are pointing um, in the direction that the wave that the wave is propagating in, uh, and it twists the other way if it's the opposite. Um, and uh, yeah, so if anywhere where you have uh, electrons and magnetic fields, this effect will happen. Um, if you have a complete vacuum, so no uh, electrons whatsoever, or if you have no magnetic fields, this effect doesn't occur. Um, the top equation that I have there uh, says that essentially the, the amount that this effect happens is related to the wavelength squared. 
So then radio wavelengths were at the longest wavelengths, lambda squared is, is, is the largest, so we see this effect more. Um, it's also dependent on what we call the rotation measure, which is dependent on um, the electron density and the magnetic field strength along the line of sight. So when we are observing uh, radio polarized radio waves, um, we can take all of these things into account. Um, now the key thing is, if we observe across a lot, uh, a large range of radio uh, wavelengths, then uh, we can see this effect happening to different extents. So here, um, I've got a selection of uh, wavelengths. Um, so we have different relative wavelengths, one, two, three, four, five. Put them in whatever units you'd like to. Um, and then the effect, the, the amount that they're twisted by, um, goes up. Um, so we have, uh, so the, if you have five times the wavelength, you get 25 times the twisting effect of this. Um, so this is um, especially noticeable at really uh, low frequency radio observations. Um, and it's important to get as many different measurements you can at different radio frequencies. Otherwise, um, you can get something called the NPi ambiguity. Uh, which is when you don't know how to connect up measurements that you've made at different wavelengths because um, you're thinking about angles and it wraps around every two pi. Um, so just to put that up again, this is the main equation that I work with. This Faraday effect is dependent on the electron density along the line of sight, magnetic field strength, which can be positive or negative depending on the orientation, um, and um, you integrate that along the line of sight um, that the wave is travelling on. So know that it's not quite as simple as that because you can have uh, multiple contributions to this uh, and it all gets a bit complicated and you need to do things like Fourier analysis to disentangle them. Um, you also need to know what or make assumptions about what your electron density is. Um, I'll just note that this isn't the only way of measuring astrophysical magnetic fields. Um, just to mention there are other things you can do. You can look at um, the polarized thermal dust, where dust grains will align preferentially in the magnetic fields. Uh, you can look at things like the Zeeman effect, in which spectral lines um, split apart. So there are complementary methods that you can use to measure magnetic fields, and often you might use a combination of multiple methods. Um, for any particular source. Um, I'm just going to pause for a moment here because I realise I kind of threw a lot of you at once, threw a lot at you at once. Um, so just to summarise what I've gone through so far, um, we can use radio telescopes to observe high energy synchrotron producing astrophysical sources, uh, so for example radio galaxies. And combining multiple radio telescopes together as a neutrometer gives much better resolution. Um, and with radio telescopes, you're able to detect the polarisation uh, from astrophysical emission. And if the angle of polarisation changes across the observed radio band, this indicates Faraday rotation. So somewhere along the line of sight, you've got magnetic fields. Um, and then you can w work out what those magnetic fields are from that. Um, so the Faraday rotation occurs due to the radio wave passing through a magnetoionic medium and can be used to calculate the magnetic field strength. And magnetic fields are very important in astrophysics, so we'll carry that point home. My cat Edith agrees. She thinks that the uh, magnetic fields are important. So, hopefully that was a crash course in, or a refresher um, in basics um, of, of the fundamentals of astrophysical uh, magnetism research and radio astronomy. Um, and now I want to tell you a little bit more about ASCAP, which is the telescope that I use, the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder Telescope, and POSSUM, which is the Polarisation Sky Survey of the University's Magnetism. So that's the project that I'm currently involved with. Uh, so ASCAP is um, an array of 36 individual radio dishes that each have a diameter of 12 metres. Um, they have something called a phased array feed um, antennas, um, which I'll explain a little bit um, explain a little bit more shortly. 
Um, but the crucial thing about this is that they have a really large field of view. Again, I'm going to show you some images to compare, or just to put into context what that 30 square degree field of view means. Uh, but it's very large, especially compared to other radio telescopes. And that means that it's really great at doing surveys because it can see a lot of the sky at once. It's easy to do, or it's quicker to do um, a radio survey um, that covers more of the sky as opposed to targeted observations at individual sources. Um, this is very technical, I don't need to dwell on this, but these are all the uh, antenna are positioned if you're looking from the top down. We get most of them in the middle, there are some that are um, further out. And you want a mix of those baselines that I mentioned earlier for the beam spirometry um, because if you have a smaller distance and a smaller baseline, that's sensitive to things that are at a larger scale, so a lower resolution, uh, but you still want to be able to pick up those features. Uh, but then you want some that are further apart from each other as well, so you can pick up some of the smaller scales. Um, so yeah, this is an example image um, from ASCAP. So this is false colour, as all radio images are. Uh, but this is looking at a lovely supernova remnant, and you can see uh, each of these dots here is a galaxy, uh, and you can see some extended radio galaxies in the field of view as well. But I put on here the approximate size of the moon to scale. So each of these squares um, is, a, is a degree across, um, and so the moon half a degree across um, is about that big. So maybe if you're looking at the sky, it doesn't seem that that large, um, but yeah, you compare it to the moon. If anyone's done astrophotography, um, it might put it into perspective as, as to how much of the sky ASCAP can see at once. And uh, that's a nice little illustration um, of that on the right. Um, so what it, how it does this um, is that it has 36 beams of the sky at any one time. Um, so. In radio astronomy, uh, a beam is what we call the, the area of the sky that we're looking at with the, with the radio telescope. Um, and what ASCAP can do is it can, with uh, some, uh, it's essentially just introducing electronic delays into the signal processing. Um, but what it can do is it can um, look at a slightly different area of sky um, with the uh, different parts of the phase array feed. So they're looking in 36 slightly different directions at once. Um, and you can combine them in different patterns. You can have them really closely together um, if you want to have observations that are really sensitive. Uh, you can spread them further apart for a bigger field of view. Um, and it's really useful as well for fast radio burst localization. So that's something that's been a hot topic in astrophysics recently. Uh, flashes of radio emission that we're still not quite sure where they're coming from. Um, in this image here, this is um, from, from ASCAP. And, um, uh, this is a representation of the different beams that are on the sky, and the red dot there is the extent to which they can localise fast radio bursts with ASCAP. So by having 36 independent beams, um, you can do stuff like FRB localisation that you are. That's just an added bonus. And um, so ASCAP has only really actually gotten going over the past few years. Um, kind of as I was starting my PhD was when it was get, getting into its early science phase and then getting in initial scientific observations. But it's already managed to complete a full survey of the sky. Very shallow, mind, so not very sensitive. Um, but we're already starting to see a load of brilliant objects in the southern radio sky from ASCAP. And so if you do a search for RACS, the Rapid ASCAP Continuum Survey, all of this data is available for you to have a look at. You can just scroll around the sky um, and see what there is. Um, there's, there's a lot to look at. In terms of the in-depth surveys um, with our SCAP, so um, as I mentioned, I work on FOSSUM, which is the Polarization Sky Survey. Um, but there are other science cases as well um, that are using our SCAP. Some of them are commensal, which means that they can happen at the same time. Um, so FOSSUM is commensal with EMU, the evolutionary map of the universe. Essentially, the polarization images that we produce in possum, um, the total intensity images are used by EMU um, to do their science with. 
Um, but the, uh, you'll notice there's an affinity for naming things after Australian animals. Um, astronomers are either really good or really bad at naming things, depending on your perspective. Um, yeah, dingo, possum, uh, wallaby, emu. On the part of an unrelated survey called Quokka, all the animals basically are represented. Um, and I thought I'd show you some of the highlights that ASCAP has released so far. So not just from Possum, the survey that I work on, um, but from all across the board of these surveys as well. Uh, so how many of you um, observed the um, small man who had a car, or large man who had a car? You have to be well travelled in order to be able to do that. Uh, but here's what they look like in the radio. Um, so here we've got the SNC on the left. Um, and this um, has been a project for um, the, the, the gas, gas gap. Some of the names are atrocious. Um, but uh, they've been looking at uh, neutral hydrogen filaments. Um, so we can see those filaments represented here. And uh, here's just a total intensity image there of the large Magellan cloud. And that was one of the early science um, images that was, that was made. Um, so you can see. Um, some of the extended structure there, um, but also a lot of the details. So that's something that ASCAP is really good at. Uh, we've got images of uh, the galactic plane. Um, so this is as we're looking on the galaxy, and we can see supernova remnants. Um, we can see background radio galaxies as well. Uh, I realize this isn't showing up particularly well on the screen, but I'd really encourage you to go away and have a look at ASCAP images because they're really nice. Um, this uh, on the right is an image of the galactic center, and one thing that ASCAP has already been used to discover is a transient, so that's something which uh, is there sometimes, but not all the time. So you can see the two panels there um, where something is blinking on and off. Um, I think the science is still ongoing to find out what that is. Um, we've got the, um, I'm, I might be biased, but these are my favourites, I think, because um, they are of radio galaxies. Um, so these are both from EMU, the Evolutionary Map of the Universe Survey. Um, and so what we have here, the red is radio, the blue is x-ray, and the green is optical. Um, so you can hear a, a, um, a cloud, of, cloud, a bubble of x-ray emission, um, that's surrounding um, a radio galaxy. So this here is your galaxy, and it's got its jets coming out, um, and um, that's a really useful tool in uh, decoding the environment of galaxies. Um, this is a particular highlight from um, one of the pilot surveys that EU has done. Um, it's called the Dancing Ghost. Um, it's what it's been nicknamed, because what we have here are two galaxies, so here and up the top there, um, both radio galaxies, both spewing out those jets, um, but they're, they're possibly interacting, uh, possibly. We know that the galaxies are at a similar redshift, uh, and it certainly looks like the, there's some interaction going on in there. Um, but again, that's a particular in, particularly interesting case uh, that's been picked up by ASCAP but hadn't, hadn't been seen before in other previous radio surveys. Um, just to highlight some of the science that Possum itself is working on, we maybe don't have as many pretty images yet as some of the other ASCAP surveys, um, but the science that um, me and my colleagues, well, mostly my colleagues are doing, um, is um, going to hopefully be really useful in determining things about magnetic fields um, in the universe. So we have uh, the nearby universe, so looking at the magnetic fields of our galaxy, so this is a map of rotation measures. So here we've got magnetic fields coming into and out of the field of view. So that's telling us about the different directions. Uh, we've got things like um, looking at uh, supernova remnants. That's FM 1006. Um, and then what I study mostly are radio galaxies. So um, this is one in particular that I've been looking at. Again, we've got our X-ray in purple. We've got radio emission in, in yellow and red. Um, and so we can, we can see how that radio emission is coming out. Um, and we can do things on a much larger scale as well, measuring the rotation measures um, of galaxy clusters and of galaxies. Um, 
The stuff specifically that I've been working on um, are these radio galaxies, and um, here's a couple of the plots that I made for my thesis. Um, so here we're looking at a radio galaxy. Uh, the galaxy itself is within the box that I've put on, on the bigger uh, diagrams there. So we've got our galaxy in the middle here, that's an optical view, and that's an infrared view. Uh, and what we can see is that if we look at the polarised intensity in the middle, there's a lot of polarisation in that um, upper um, lobe um, up there, a lot more than the one down here. And what that could be an indication of is that there's more stuff in front of the lobe that is um, on the bottom because there's less polarisation that's getting through. Um, and another thing that you can see from these maps um, is that there are features in the rotation measure, which is this map here, uh, which may correspond to areas in the galaxy itself. So there's a discontinuity there, for instance, which uh, corresponds to a peak in the total intensity. So that indicates that there's physically something going on in that region to cause that increase in brightness. Um, and the fact that there's a rotation measure difference there as well indicates that it's probably local to the source. Um, but we don't know. This is something that we're still trying to disentangle. Uh, here's another example of a very similar galaxy um, where, uh, um, more notably in this one, the rotation mode can go from positive to negative, so you can see the patches of red and blue over on the right hand side. And so, what that indicates is that the magnetic field is changing directions. Because it's only dependent on the electron density or the magnetic fields, electron density can't go negative, so it's got to be a magnetic field. Um, the question is, is that within the radio galaxy lobe, or is that effect happening somewhere closer to us? And actually the polarisation is only being affected by that, say, within our own Milky Way galaxy, and that's affecting the observations. And I've got a lot of galaxies for that, so I wanted to make some pretty images. So these are all, I've not really considered the scale very much here, I've just kind of smashed them all on the slide, but here are some of the galaxies that I've been working with. So uh, we've got an optical background, so there's stars and galaxies, and then the yellowy reds are um, the radio emission that we see with ASCAP, and some of the sources have got X-ray emission as well. So um, can see uh, a couple of the X-ray sources there as well. So these are the pretty pictures that I get to look at when I'm doing my research um, and not screaming at Python. But yes, you can make some very pretty images um, with the ASCAP radio telescope. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that I showed you them. It wasn't just all kind of technical details and, and science. Um, got a lot of our yeah. But for all of these objects, the the similarity is you have a central galaxy somewhere, here or here, and then you have jets coming off them and then the resulting uh, lobes. Uh, so here we've got a galaxy where the lobes have been bent backwards, you can see them travelling up like that. You have some which are maybe more of a standard shape, but all sorts of them. And um, one of the cool things that I've been involved with that isn't related to polarisation, but I wanted to mention it, um, is has any of you used the Zooniverse before? Okay, a few of you, a few of you. I would encourage you to do it, it's fun. Um, and uh, we've got a, uh, a, a Zooniverse project which we're currently getting going. Uh, it's, a, it's a process, um, but it's a follow-up to the Radio Galaxy Zoom, uh, Zooniverse project. Uh, called Radio Galaxy Zoom EMU because we're using EMU images from the ASCAP telescope. Um, and one of the things we're doing is um, identifying um, interesting radio galaxies and um, assembling them. So putting all the pieces of radio emission together and linking them up. So, for example, this here, is it maybe this galaxy? It probably is that galaxy. Put identification on that. Is this radio emission part of that source? Is there potentially some jets and lobes coming off of that? You might need to have a more zoomed out view of that. Um, got some other examples here that I very quickly um, pasted in. Uh, but that is coming up hopefully soon. So that's some citizen science that you could get involved in if you wanted to. 
Um, I'm just going to put one note about um, going into the future of radio astronomy. Again, if you're here at Manchester, you will probably have been told something about the Square Kilometre Array. Um, its headquarters are just down the road at Drogable Bank. Uh, and this is the next big thing in radio astronomy. This is going to um, be the thing that we're, that we're working towards at the moment. It's even in the name of ASCAP, the Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder Telescope. Um, it's going to be spread across Australia and South Africa, and it's just going to do some really cool radio astronomy. So now it's a really great time to be getting into radio astronomy because the future has been invested in radio astronomy. Um, I'm very excited to see what's, uh, what's going to happen there. Um, I'm going to finish up there because um, I don't want to keep you for too long. Um, but just a summary, hopefully I've given you a very, very quick whirlwind tour of the fact that magnetic fields are ubiquitous in the universe, they're everywhere, but there's still a lot to learn about them. And the key focus of radio astronomy going into the future is magnetic fields. It's one of the key science projects of the Square Kilometre Array. Um, and yeah, it's an exciting time to be a radio astronomer. Um, I'm going to leave it there. Um, I realise I have, there's so much more I could have talked about, so hopefully that wasn't too overwhelming. Um, but thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions.